It is my honor and privilege to invite all of you to point your Bibles to John chapter 19, the Gospel of John chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, then you're welcome to use one from the chair in front of you. You will find John chapter 19 on page 905. Page 905, we'll begin reading in the middle of John 19, right around verse 16, which if you're using a chair Bible, you will find under the heading of the crucifixion. So I'm going to read there under the crucifixion all the way to the end of the chapter, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to get to work. Lord willing, it should be 30, 35 minutes or so. John 19, beginning at verse 16. So they took Jesus, and He went out bearing His own cross to a place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified Him, and with Him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it so we may see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill Scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that the legs might be broken, and that they may be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came up blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones may be broken. And again, another Scripture that says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. 
Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, your name is great and greatly to be praised. For here we have just read of the most extravagant expression of love that has ever been expressed. I pray that we would see it. I pray that we would understand it. I pray that our hearts would receive it. And that the seed of your good word would find good soil in our bad hearts in order that it might bear good fruit for your good name. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son, so that anyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. That was the first Bible verse that my parents had me to memorize when I was a kid. And for good reason. John 3.16 puts a fine point on Christianity. And it puts a fine point on the gospel of John. This little church, we've spent over a year in the gospel of John, going verse by verse through this gospel. And everything in this gospel has been leading up to this. The Gospel of John is a little bit like um, one of those concave mirrors that you, f- you find at the fair. Do you know the ones that I'm talking about? When you stand in front of those concave mirrors, everything that's directly in front of you, like your face and your nose, everything's really big. But on the outside of you, like your arms, everything's really small and compressed. So your face and your nose are huge, but like your arms are tiny. You look like a human Tyrannosaurus Rex or something. Well, the Gospel of John is a little bit like that in that the first part, John starts off, the kind of curtain opens up on this Gospel with the spotlight on Jesus Christ, whom John calls Logos, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Way back in eons of time. And then John fast forwards right up to the point of creation. In verse 3, it says, all things were made through Him. And then all of created history, all of biblical history, everything in the Bible is super condensed, fast forwarded right up to the incarnation when God became flesh. The Word, the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. Eons of history untold, condensed into a few verses. It's the outside of the mirror. John gives no attention to Jesus' birth. John tells us nothing of Jesus as a child. He opens with Jesus 30 years old or so, beginning his public ministry. And then the timeline on Jesus slows down. And the first 10 chapters of John's gospel contain the three-year public ministry of the Lord Jesus. And then when we get to chapter 11, it slows down even further. In fact, from chapter 11 to the rest of the book, 21 chapters, half of the book of John is one week in the life of Jesus. From chapter 11 to 21 is one week. And even within that slowdown, he slows down even more. In fact, from chapter 13 until now, the end of chapter 19, has been one day. We've been in this day in the life of Jesus since the beginning of March. What does that tell you about what John thinks is the most important day in Jesus' life? The most important day in history. 
This is what John has been moving toward since the beginning of his gospel. Truth be told, this is what God has been moving toward since the beginning of time, this day. And so we would do well to follow the apostles' lead, to slow down, and to contemplate the matters contained in this one day. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to consider three questions regarding the crucifixion of Jesus. Number one question, how did Jesus die? Number two, why did Jesus die? And number three, why does that matter that Jesus died? That's how this is outlined. That's how you'll find it outlined on the back side of your worship guide. So when you came in, if you received a worship guide, you're welcome to follow along, take notes if you like. Otherwise, just follow along as we work through those three questions. So question number one, how did Jesus die? To answer that question, we're going to divide this text into two parts. First, we're going to see Jesus lifted up on the cross in verses 16 to 30. And then we're going to see Jesus taken down from the cross and then laid in a tomb from verses 31 to 42. First, Jesus Lift it up. So you can go back to verse 16, and we're going to read this all the way up to verse 30. Let's just read it again. So they took Jesus, and He went out, bearing His own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. They crucified Him there with two others, one on one side, one on the other, Jesus in the middle. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews did not like this, and so they went to him and they said, take that down. He just said, King of the Jews, take out that, down that sign. And in verse 22, Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, so they cast lots for the tunic. This was in fulfillment of Scripture, which said, They divided my garment among them, for my clothing they cast lots. Michael read that earlier today. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, four ladies, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved, that's John the, the gospel writer, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. They understood what that meant, so John took Mary to his own home. Verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing all that was now finished, said to fulfill Scripture, I thirst. So they took a jar full of sour wine, put a sponge in it, put the sponge on a hyssop branch, and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. After the Lord Jesus was betrayed in the garden and delivered over to the chief priests, he was brought to the Roman authorities, to a governor in Judea, a spineless politician by the name of Pontius Pilate. Pilate caved to the evil will of the people and sentenced to death a man that he knew was innocent. They flogged Jesus. Flogging, I explained a bit last week, is a vicious and brutal torture which included whipping someone with leather straps laced with shards of bone. The soldiers then twisted a, a thorn of crowns and jammed it onto his head, and they wrapped him in a purple robe, and they mocked him and beat him. From there, they strapped a horizontal beam across Jesus' back, and they forced him to carry that beam outside of the city to a place called Golgotha, the place of a skull. Probably a herald would have went before them. As Jesus was being paraded through the city, that herald would have announced his crime all the way up to the place of his execution. From the other Gospels, we learn that Jesus, exhausted from the flogging, fell under the weight of his heavy cross, and another man was forced to carry it the rest of the way. Roman crosses came in the shape of a T. There was an upright pole that was notched to receive the horizontal pole. And once Jesus reached Golgotha, they drove nails through his wrists into the wooden beam. 
He would have been lifted up just above eye level and placed on the upright beam. His feet would then have been nailed to the upright beam, either on the sides or through the middle. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians, but it was perfected by the Romans. It was designed to inflict the greatest amount of suffering for the longest period of time. Criminals were stripped naked and hung in the open under the sun for everyone to see. And a sign was placed above them or around their neck, what they had done, warning others, anyone who would pass by, this is what becomes a person who defies the might of Rome. Death on the cross came by prolonged asphyxiation. The weight of the body being pulled downward on the arms made breathing almost impossible which is why they nailed the feet to the cross. So the person on the cross could push up on the nails through their feet, breathe for as long as they could stand the pain, and then collapse again. Criminals often hung on the cross for days at a time. It was a gruesome, shameful, and painful death. And it was one that was reserved for the worst of crimes. In fact, Roman citizens, no matter how gruesome their own crime, were exempted from this form of torture. The Romans felt that it was below a citizen of Rome. Well, John gives almost no details about Jesus' crucifixion. Perhaps this is because the audience would have been well familiar with what crucifixion was, but it's also possible that the pain of it was just still too near to him. While the Lord hung naked on the cross, fighting to breathe, Roman soldiers were at His feet, dividing His clothes between them. These clothes were memorials, trophies that they would hang on the wall of this famous man that they helped crucify. Jewish men wore five articles of clothing. They wore an inner garment and an outer garment a belt, sandals, and a turban. But there were four of these men. And so when it came to Jesus' tunic, these jackals tearing apart the remains of the Lord Jesus decided to cast dice to find out who would get the tunic. The tunic itself seemed to be something valuable, Seamless, which was rare. Perhaps it was a gift someone had given to Jesus throughout His ministry. Perhaps it belonged to His Father who had died, and He took it on when His Father left. Either way, these soldiers playing their satanic games cast lots to see who would get the tunic. Near these four soldiers were four women and the, gospel, and the gospel writer John. Jesus' own mother, Jesus' aunt, Mary, the wife of a man named Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. What a contrast that provides, those four women and John mourning the death of the Lord and those four soldiers playing dice for His clothes. What must it have been like to be Mary, Jesus' own mother, watching her son suffer, being slowly asphyxiated to death? She must have been thinking about all of those precious years that she had with him. Undoubtedly, she would have been remembering the words of the old man, Simeon, who told her when Jesus was just a baby, a sword will pierce through your own soul. She was feeling that sword being thrust at that very moment. She was feeling a kind of pain that can only be felt by a mother. The Lord, pushing up on the nails through His feet, takes a breath and looks at His mother and says, 
woman, behold, your son looks at John, his beloved disciple, and says, behold, your mother. John and Mary both knew what that meant. It was the very language that was used at adoption. Behold your parents. And so John took care of Mary for the rest of her life. Through his own suffering, the Lord was taking care of his own mother. Having endured the flogging and the exhaustion of carrying his cross, having fighting breath for several hours, Jesus is severely dehydrated. And so he says, in fulfillment of centuries-old scriptures, I thirst. Jesus was a man, fully human, fully God, and fully human. The Lord Jesus felt every lash of the whip on His back. He felt every severed nerve through his wrists and feet. Jesus in his ministry became tired. He got hungry. Jesus felt sorrow and wept. Jesus rejoiced. Jesus groaned. Jesus felt pain. And here Jesus thirsted. The one who had offered the woman at the well living water was thirsty. Someone took a sponge and dipped it in sour wine and stuck it on a hyssop branch and offered it to his mouth. This is different from the offering that we read in the Gospel of Matthew, which was a wine mixed with gall. If you know the the Gospel record, you remember that offering, which Jesus did not take. Wine mixed with gall was to numb the pain, which might seem to you to be a a kind thing to do. But again, this crucifixion was something that was meant to last for days. Jesus refused that wine mixed with gall. Verse 30, we read, when Jesus had received the sour wine, He said, it is finished. And He bowed His head and He gave up His spirit. In the original language, the phrase, it is finished, is one word, one word in Greek. It means that Jesus' ministry was now complete. He had accomplished the task the Father had given Him to do from the beginning of time. All that was needed to pardon your sin and mine had been done. It is finished means all has been done, everything has met its end, the objectives have been reached, the purpose has been fulfilled. And Charles Spurgeon once remarked on that phrase that it would take all the words that have been spoken and all the words that could be spoken to explain that one word, it is finished. After Jesus said this, John says he gave up his spirit. No one took Jesus' life from him. He laid it down of his own accord. He had given up his own spirit. Even his own act of death was in his hands. Literally, the phrase reads, he delivered over his own spirit. It's the same word that Pilate delivered Jesus over. Same word. Jesus is on the cross. Well, that's Jesus being lifted up on the cross. In the next part, we read Jesus being taken down from the cross and buried. So drop your gaze to verse 31, and we'll read to the end of the chapter again. It was a day of preparation. Remember, it's Passover. Passover was on, was, there was a Sabbath coming up. They couldn't remain on the cross. So they, the, the Jews went to Pilate, and they asked that their legs would be broken, so they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came up blood and water. 
And then John steps in and he says, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he's telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And they will look on him whom they have pierced. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he could take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he took the body. Nicodemus, who was, we've met, we met him back in chapter 3, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And so they took the body of Jesus and they wrapped it in linen cloths and spices as the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden there was a new tomb. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus in that tomb. Passover was on the day after Jesus' crucifixion. It was a holy day, a Sabbath. And the Jews did not want to keep these bodies hanging on the cross during their holy day. And so they asked Pilate if, if he would grant permission to the soldiers to break the legs of those who were being crucified. You understand what this would have done. Of course, if they break their legs, then, the, then those who are crucified are still hanging on their arms. They're not able to push up with their legs. Therefore, they would quickly suffocate, and they would quickly die. So the soldiers, in obedience to Pilate, go to the, to the guys. They go to one guy, and they break his legs. The other guy, they do the same. But when they came to Jesus, they noticed he had already died. He had already given up his spirit. So they didn't break his legs. Instead, one of them took a spear and thrust it into his side. Jesus said, blood and water flowed out. This happened around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Sabbath in those days began around 6 p.m. So they hurried to get Jesus off the cross. And there was a nearby tomb. John says that it was in a garden. A rich man named Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin. John says a secret follower of Jesus. Obtained permission to take the body down. Nicodemus was also there. And he brings along some aloe and some myrrh and some spices. And they wrap Jesus in linen. And they cover his body in the spices and they lay him in that tomb, in that garden nearby. Well, it seems John is doing this to, to communicate at least two things to us. He wants us to see at least a couple of things about the crucifixion of Jesus. It would seem that John wants us to know that Jesus actually died that Jesus actually died. He gives us several proofs. First, the soldiers did not break his legs. These were trained executioners. These were men whose whole living was made, making sure that people died on the cross. And they were under the order of a Roman governor. And they would never dare disobey that man's commandment unless they were 100% sure that he was already dead. So when they came to Jesus, they did recognize that he was dead. But just to be sure that he was dead, they thrust a spear into his side. The third reason is that Jesus was wrapped up and laid in a tomb. John wants us to know that Jesus was actually dead. And the other thing it seems John would have us to know is that God was maintaining absolute control over the events of His Son's crucifixion. Notice Him regularly referring to this is in fulfillment of this Scripture. The soldiers dividing the garments in fulfillment of Scripture. The details of Jesus' suffering, fulfillment of Scripture. Not breaking of His bones, fulfillment of Scripture. The piercing of His side and the looking on to Him, fulfilling Scripture. Well, when you press the text even more, all kinds of Old Testament prophecies find their fulfillment here in Jesus' crucifixion. The point being that God is moving all of these things along according to His definite plan. And John wants us, the readers, to know that. And the reason he wants us to know that brings us to our second question. Why did Jesus die? 
Why did Jesus die? Surveying the New Testament, you'll find many reasons as to why the Lord Jesus had to die. But for our brief time together, I will give you four reasons Jesus died. Four reasons. We'll do them as a countdown. Not in terms of importance, probably, but one does flow into the other. So four reasons why Jesus died. Number four, Jesus died to pay the penalty for sin. Jesus died to pay the penalty for sin. Cornerstone, one of the most important things that you need to know about Christianity is that Christianity is not about God rewarding good people. It's about God forgiving bad people. Christianity is not about God rewarding good people, but God forgiving bad people. Good moral people don't need a crucified Savior. They need a motivational speaker to continue doing the good moral things they do. They don't certainly need a suffering Messiah. If the crucifixion that we have just read seems cruel and gruesome to us, it's probably because we haven't understood the nature of sin. If the idea of God orchestrating the events of His own Son's horrible death bothers you, friend, it's probably because you're not nearly bothered enough by your own sin. Because if that's the case, if we minimize the offensiveness of our sin against God, do you see how that would also limit our obedience to Him? Limit our devotion to Him? Do you see how it would limit our understanding of God's love and make it anemic? We would think, well, of course God loves me. I do all of these wonderful things for Him. And then when Christ comes along to bid you deny yourself, die to yourself, you would take that to mean don't cuss, don't smoke, be kind to people. But when it comes to finances and sexuality and your future, you would hold back. Thinking, hands off Jesus, you haven't earned the right to tell me what to do, especially if that makes me feel unhappy or unsatisfied. The death of Jesus on the cross was to pay the penalty of our sin. While Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible says that our sins were laid on Him. Corey just led us in a song with that very phrase. 1 Peter 2, 24, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree. In the famous Isaiah 53, verse 5, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. God is just. He cannot and He will not excuse sin. Your sin, my sin, the sin of every person deserves the just wrath of a holy God. And the wages of that sin is death. And Jesus died to absorb the wrath of God in our place. Jesus' life was a payment of the penalty of that death. The death that was demanded by the justice of God. Number three, Jesus died to bring us to God. Jesus died to bring us to God. This is 1 Peter 3.18, for Jesus, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God. 
Our rebellion against God has fixed a chasm between Him and us, a gulf between us that cannot be crossed. It is far too wide, and we cannot find our way back. You see, our problem is twofold. One, our sin has disqualified us from heaven. And our lack of righteousness has meant that we are not even qualified to begin with for heaven. Jesus gave us both at the cross. We needed to have our sins removed. That was one. But we also needed to have the righteousness of God. That was two. Jesus gave us both at the cross. Many of you well know 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made Him... Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. He took our sin on Himself. He gave us His righteousness. He bridged the gap between us and God, and those of us who are in Christ are in God. Number two. Jesus died to show God's love for sinners. Jesus died to show God's love for sinners. Do you remember John 3.16, which I quoted earlier? This is how God loved us. He gave His one and only Son. The cross of Jesus Christ is God's demonstration of His love for sinners. Romans 5.8, God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus' death was to show God's love. And what manner of love is that? That He would die for His own enemies. Jesus did not die because we were lovely. He died because He is lovely. And He died to make us lovely. Number one, Jesus died to bring glory to God. Jesus died to bring glory to God. Ephesians 1 tells us that from the foundation of the world, God's plan had always been to unite all things in Christ to the praise of His glorious grace. Everything God does is a demonstration of His glorious grace. History is simply a mountain range of God demonstrating His grace. And the cross is like Mount Everest. It's the highest demonstration of just how glorious His grace is towards sinners. Jesus died to show the glory of God's grace towards sinners. Why does that matter? Why does the death of Jesus matter? This is my third and final point, and with this we will conclude. Why does the the death of Jesus matter? Well, for one, it is finished. It is finished. Before the the Lord hung His head and gave up His spirit, He announced, it is finished. Which means that everything that had to be done to reconcile sinners, hell-deserving sinners like us, to God, had been done. Everything. There's nothing more left to do. It's finished. Everything that the justice of God demanded has been done. You know, Buddha's last words, largely it's believed that Buddha's last words were these, work hard and gain your own salvation. How different that is from it is finished. Every religion tells you do. Only Christ tells you done. Jesus' death matters to you because all that you need to have peace with God has been done through Jesus Christ. You need only to look to Him, to repent of your sin, to receive that free gift of grace in order to have peace with God. 
It is finished. It means there's no making it up to God. Because it's already been finished. A couple of years ago, I sat on a picnic table with a man who told me the reason he had been so generous later in life was because he had committed a very horrible sin against God when he was a younger man. And I'll tell you what I told him. You don't need to pay God back for your sin. Jesus has already paid that for you. It is finished. Another reason the death of Jesus matters is because it gives eternal meaning to suffering. Because God spared no expense to save you, He will not be careless with your life. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? As a believer... Your suffering is no indicator of God's disfavor or punishment. Sickness is not a sign of your lack of faith. Loss is no indication of a curse from God. In Christ, your suffering has been transformed from punishment to purification. And you are not under God's heavy hand. You are under God's gentle, loving hand. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory. Additionally, the death of Jesus matters because it sets us free from the power of sin. Romans 6, 6 through 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. When Jesus died, those who were in Christ died with Him and have been delivered from the power of sin. And the Bible says you're no longer a slave to sin. Sin doesn't have power over you any longer. So that when you're tempted to wander from the Lord, look to the cross. For there your sin breathed its last and no longer has control over you. Draw righteousness from Christ and follow Him. Overcome that temptation by the power of the cross. Hebrews 2.18 gives you this grand promise. For because He Himself suffered when tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted. Look to Him, walk in newness of life, and walk free from the power of sin. In conclusion, death of Jesus matters since those of us who have been united to Him in His death are also united to Him in His resurrection life. Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Because of the cross, those of us who are in Christ are also in Christ at His resurrection. Lord willing, we'll talk more about that next Sunday. Please stand to your feet for the prayer of confession. At the end of our services, we take a moment and we look back at the text, seeing areas of that text which has exposed the parts of our life which we have not submitted to the Lord. And we ask the Lord to forgive us of those sins. We do that as a body together. So if you would... Pray with me a prayer of confession.
Our great God and Father, the Lord of, of our Lord, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we give you thanks for him, for the gift that he is to us, for the gifts that he gives to us. We thank you for looking with favor upon us, your people, for those of us who are far off, those of us who are without God and without hope in this world. Thank you for showing us mercy. Thank you for sending Jesus to us. Lord, we confess that we have minimized our sin and thereby we have cheapened your grace. In parts of this last week, we spent indifferent to the cross of Christ. We gave little thought to Jesus and to his grace and to his mercy. And yet, though we forgot you, we just expected that you would not forget us and that you would continue to show us grace even in our indifference. You have. You always have. You always will. But help us, Lord, for we are often forgetful people, easily ensnared by the trappings of our own hearts, by the trappings of this world. And we confess to you that we have sinned and we ask that through Jesus you would forgive us. Would you enable us to see the lukewarmness of our faith? To see our own pride and self-reliance as a virus? To do what we sang earlier, to pour contempt on all of our pride? Will you help us to confess those sins to you this week? Enable us to trust Jesus and depend on His righteousness. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering this week. Those who are enduring hardships, facing questions without answers. Will you strengthen them? Will you encourage them? Will you comfort them? Will you send your gentle Holy Spirit to fill the void that suffering leaves? We thank you for Jesus' cross and for what he has done for us. He is our portion, our lot in this life, the very delight of our heart. Having him, we have everything. Hold us to Jesus this week and give us hands to hold him back. In Jesus' name we ask.